My name's David, and the chronological Bible reading for August 22nd is Jeremiah chapters 46 through 48. It may be helpful to make a note as you read these chapters today that we are not actually chronological in the book of Jeremiah. In other words, these prophecies, some of them have already taken place and are continuing to take place, but this isn't necessarily a word that God gave to Jeremiah after the fall of Babylon, which we've already read about. The first prophecy is against Egypt, and we know Egypt represents sin and slavery to sin. God sent the Hebrew people to Egypt, and we know the story that they became enslaved there. And then Moses was raised up by Yahweh to lead the people out. When we see prophecies about Egypt, it's not necessarily just the physical land of Egypt, but it's a picture of what Egypt represents. And in verse 10, God says, there will be a day that belongs to him, to Yahweh, a day of vengeance to avenge himself against his adversaries. Who are God's adversaries? Who are God's enemies? It's anyone who stands opposed to his will by not doing the thing he told you to do or by doing what you know he does not want you to do. If you are placing your trust in physical might, in money, in your strength, in your army or the army of your nation. Anything that you are trusting in that is not God will lead you down to a path of acting against God. Many people in ministry even have made an idol of their ministry. If we're not careful, the thing that God gives us to use to bless him will replace him. And God will not allow his people to settle for anything less than the absolute best, which is him and his glory. And we pray to the God of heaven, may we never fall into that trap of trusting anything apart from him and him alone. In chapter 27, the word of Yahweh comes reassuring Israel, who has been exiled at this point. The vast majority of their people slaughtered and exiled, and yet the word of God comes to them and says, You, my servant Jacob, do not be afraid, and do not be discouraged, Israel, for without fail I will save you from far away, and your descendants from the land of their captivity." Many of these people are dying, have already died, or will die in exile. How do we reconcile the truth of God's word with the real experience of these people? And I believe we do that through the understanding that you as a person are much bigger to God than you are to yourself. We limit ourselves thinking that all we are is this life, and this life is going to end someday. And if my life is going to end while I am in this exile, before I've seen the fruition of the promise of God to be brought home to the homeland, how can it possibly be true when God says, I will save you? Maybe God's promises are not all fulfilled in this life. Surely we see the first fruits of them. Surely we see lots of miraculous works in us and around us and through us. Definitely we see the benefit that it is to walk with the God of the land of the living. And yet sometimes, a person's life is taken before they see the full manifestation of the promise of God saying he will save. And if that's the case, then it must be that his promises are fully delivered to his people in the next life. Maybe when God looks on you, he sees your children and your grandchildren and your great grandchildren. Maybe he sees your spiritual children, the ones you've been discipling. Maybe he sees the people you've invited to a church service or you've shared a Bible with. Maybe he sees the people you've smiled at as you've gone down the grocery store aisle and your smile encouraged someone and brightened their day. Maybe when God says he will save you, he's 
thinking of more than just your physical life, but he's thinking about your soul. Chapter 47 is a prophecy about the Philistines and the fall of that people in what would be Palestine today, the West Bank. The Philistines were the primary people group during the time of David whom God would use to judge Israel when Israel fell into sin. Jeremiah prophesies a day that will wipe out all of the Philistines and history tells us that they have been entirely wiped out. Even the mightiest giant people cannot stand opposed to the word of God or the determined will of God. Chapter 48 is a prophecy against the land of Moab, and we know that Moab was the nation that descended from Lot and his incestuous relationships with his daughters. Remember Lot in Sodom when God called him out? The angels had to drag him basically out of the city They didn't want to leave their lifestyle behind, and yet God spared them anyway. Even during that sparing, the angels said to Lot, go to this far away city. And Lot said, that's too far. Let me go to the hill country instead. Lot's daughters said, instead of going and finding husbands for ourselves, let's get our father drunk and have children by him. So much compromise marked this territory. And it doesn't mean that everybody in that nation or everybody descended from Lot was a wicked person. And we know that Ruth was a Moabite. She was a woman of great faith, but she didn't choose to be identified by her ethnicity or by her national heritage. She said to her mother-in-law, I will go with you. Your people will be my people. Your God will be my God. She was not less or more valuable because of her heritage, but her faith and her humility exalted her and she became the wife of Boaz. And it was from her that King David came And through David, Yeshua, whom we call Jesus Christ. This world is continually trying to trick us, trying to convince us to find our hope in political candidates, in human alliances. The world wants us to identify with what nation we come from or even what sect of a religious order we subscribe to. And God is saying through it all, none of that can save you. None of that is important to him. He just wants relationship with each of us. And he will pour out wrath on anything that comes in between you and him. God bless you, my friends. Thank you for being on this journey with me. We'll see you tomorrow.